All right, so everyone, thank you so much for having me. Like I said, my name is Josh. I'm a senior major in public policy, and I was in this Power 2 class just a couple of years ago. And I want to come back to show you, to basically have a discussion about some things I've learned about presentations and public speaking since I've been in Power 2. Specifically, I want to talk about content, delivery, and visual aids. Basically, everything you need to give an effective presentation. And I really think this is relevant to talk about because we're all, I remember being in Power 2, we're all in from different majors, all have different plans of what we want to do in life, but whatever you want to do in life, you're going to have to give presentations, and those are going to make or break your success. So I think that these are really relevant skills for all of us to build, and as you know, Dr. Waters, I guess I can flatter her while she's out of the room, she's a great Power 2 instructor, and you're really lucky to have her. So anyways, I'd like to focus on content delivery and visual aids, but before doing so, I'd like to get to know all of you a little bit. So if you could all just go around and say your name, your uh, and your name, and then one thing you want to work on in terms of public speaking or visual aids, uh, public speaking or presentations. Um, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm sophomore in Emmy, and I think one thing I would like to work on is eye contact and remembering not to look up or down. I'm Zach, and I would like to work on uh, giving specific and strategic pauses in my presentations to allow the audience to think about what I've just said. I'm Dishan, I'm a sophomore in field science. And I'd like to work on eye contact, movement, and flow. flow. My name is Brittany, I'm a sophomore in psychology. I'm Max. Um, I think mostly I want to work on just feeling generally more comfortable when speaking publicly. I'm Amy. Um, I'm a sophomore major in English. I think similarly, I want to be more comfortable and I want to work on fluidity and precision. Hi, I'm Audrey. I want to work on minimizing stumbling, increasing flow, and Hi, I'm Patty. I would like to work on not using filler words. I'm Kristen, and I would like to work on flow and clarity. My name is Julie, and I would like to feel more at ease when speaking in public and also when the audience feels at ease when they want to be. Hi, I'm Haley. I'm a sophomore in college as well. I would like to work more on the flow and pauses. I'm Roslyn, I'm an anthropology major, and I'd like to feel like more on presence. I tend to flag bug out when I'm giving public speeches because I have fear, so I'd like to work on that. Hey, uh, my name's Nathan. I a fifth major. I'd like to work on trying to move my slides faster. I'm Samir, I'm a home bio major, and I'd like to work on not using the word. I'm Rory, I'm a history major, and I'd like to work on the mechanics of the Okay, great. So I think you all brought up some really good things, and we'll hopefully touch on most of them throughout what I've prepared. But if there's anything that I don't that I don't bring up, feel free to raise your hand, call out if it's constructive. It's really better if this becomes more of a conversation, more of a dialogue. So like I mentioned, I'd like to focus on content delivery and visual aids, but I'd like to start out with a story. And it's a story about astronauts. These seven astronauts were part of NASA's Space Challenger mission. And it's a mission that captured the attention of the nation, particularly because of uh, this woman here, Krista McCullough, who was the first person in the Teachers in Space program. And she was scheduled to teach some lessons to students across the country from outer space, including a tour of the spacecraft to be entitled The Ultimate Field Trip. So on January 28, 1986, the astronauts boarded the Challenger, and at 11.39 a.m., they took off. And you can see the launch here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. As I mentioned, this launch captured the attention of the, of the nation particularly because of the Teacher in Space program. It's estimated that 48% of children ages 9 to 13 were watching the Challenger as it launched. And then 73 seconds into the launch, there was a sudden explosion, and everyone on board was killed. Does anyone know why the Challenger mission failed? Um, the O-ring Right, so Haley, you're saying the O-ring. 
Yeah, that's exactly what it was. So it's this device here called the O-ring. An O-ring creates a seal between two pipes. And it was a particularly cold day in Florida that morning, such that you can see there's even icicles forming underneath the launch pad. And it was so cold that the O-ring hardened, and it lost its elasticity. And that led, as you can see, to a fire, and eventually to an explosion. Let's back up to the night before the Challenger launch. Morton Thiokol was the company that manufactured the O-ring. And Morton Thiokol looked at the weather forecast and saw how cold it was going to be. And they called NASA and said, hey, listen, we think there might be a problem, and we're recommending that you postpone the launch. To back up its recommendation, Morton Thiokol sent the following visual aid. You can see here a history of O-ring damage and the different, uh, a code showing the different types of damage. And then Morton Thiokol sent this more extensive visual aid. What are your reactions when you look at this visual aid? What do you get from this? Nothing. 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 There's just too much on there, right? So that's likely how NASA responded. We have so much information. Does it jump out at you here that there's an impending disaster with the whole spacecraft about to blow up? No. So there's a lot of information on here, and that key message is not coming out. So this is an example of ineffective use of visual age, and ineffective communication. And unfortunately, the result of this poor communication was disaster. Now let's fast forward 10 years to this man here, Edward Tufte, who is a professor of information design at Yale. Tufte analyzed the Challenger disaster and said, what if? What if Morton Thiokol had presented the information differently in a way that was more easily understood by NASA? And to give an example of how to do this, he created this graph. You see here there's some known points in blue, and then Tufte extrapolated this red curve. Is it easier to see here how at lower temperatures there's a greater risk of O-ring damage? That's a little bit more clear, right? This graph isn't perfect. I mean, any graph that has extrapolation is not perfect, but the trend is at least more clear. And then here's another way. For those of you who like science, this is a famous physicist here, Richard Feynman, and he took a small O-ring and dropped it into a cup of ice water and then took it out a few minutes later to show how it had lost its elasticity. So what if Warren Thiebaud called up NASA and said, hey, listen, we're worried about the low temperatures. To show you what we mean, take an O-ring and put it in the freezer, and when you take it out, you'll see for yourself how it lost its elasticity. So either the graph or Richard Feynman's approach might have been more effective ways to get that message across. So why did I tell this story? I didn't tell this story to depress you, and I hope that I didn't. But I just want to hit home how important effective communication is. And it's, communicating effectively isn't about how smart you are. These were actual rocket scientists. You know, they, these are the quintessential smart people. And they still messed it up. So communication is not just about being how smart you are, it's about how well you can communicate your ideas effectively to an audience. And like I mentioned, we're all in different majors here, we all have different plans in life. Some of us will go into law, business, academia, startups, whatever. But wherever we go, we're going to have to give presentations. And hopefully, in this class, and in the presentations you won't give, it won't be a life or death situation. I don't think, Dr. Waters, I don't think there's any life or death presentations in this class. Well, are there? probably not. Okay. You still want to do well. With that in mind, we'll focus on a few things that are really important to give an effective presentation. So content. What do you put into your presentation, and how do you organize it? Visual aids. How do you use visual aids that enhance and don't distract from your presentation? And then finally, how do you wrap that together into an effective delivery? So let's start out with, with content. Before you get very far in a presentation, you want to know something called your age. And as you might guess, I'm not talking about how old you are. This is an acronym. And in the oral communication program, we love acronyms. So just bear with me. This won't be the last one that you hear this, this morning, this afternoon. First, you want to know your audience. You can have the same message, the same presentation, but switch it up just based on who you're presenting to. You also want to know the goal of your presentation. 
Are you trying to simply inform your audience, or are you trying to persuade them? Are you trying to get them to take action on something? And then also your environments. This includes things like the time constraints you have. I know my time constraints now because I actually have class at 12.50. There's, there's other constraints such as the technology that you have. So I have my presentation emailed to myself. I, have, I brought my own uh, VGA cable just in case this one wasn't working. You always want to come prepared with multiple ways to have your presentation work. This is all kind of abstract right now, so now I want to make it a little bit more personal. Like I mentioned, I'm a public policy major, and I recent, I, in the fall quarter, I was working on a project with some other public policy majors on a very sad issue, domestic child sex trafficking. And we were working on it, and we gave a presentation on our findings to the public policy department. And then last quarter, we actually flew out to DC to present our findings to nine congressmen. So just thinking about your age, what are some things you'd want to know before going into the room with nine congressmen. Zach, do you have an idea? Well, going back to what you said, you want to know how much time you have to present your findings to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you think that you can run over time with them? Uh, <laughs> Absolutely not. In a strict schedule. And like most, most of these presentations, they showed up late, and we ended exactly on time. So we had to be ready for that. And we condensed our presentation in preparation for that. Any other ideas? Amy? Were there standards you set on the issue? Like if it's for a wedding, if they, if they have a previous stance on the issue, what would you come to them? Yeah, definitely. So maybe if they've already put forward some bills on the issue, if there's anything online that we can find out about their views on the issue, definitely. Max, you're raising your hand, right? She got it. OK. Any other thoughts? Dr. Walker? Well, well, just how much they know, right? I mean, not just their position, but I would even back it up, and how much do they know about, about the topic? I mean, I've had, uh, known, I knew a cardiac surgeon who went in to argue on behalf of reimbursement for cardiac surgery with our local congressperson. She just said, okay, so um, where, what does your industry have to say about X? I mean, she didn't know, you know, about the issue. I mean, she's making policy decisions, but didn't have kind of the basic knowledge. So they had to be able to kind of like an elevator pitch, formulate the problem or the issue very succinctly and informatively and without wasting their time because they don't like their time wasted. Definitely. So you want to know how much the audience know, and luckily I've had a client that kind of briefed us on that. Excellent. Very good. So these are all some practical examples of how you want to know your age during a presentation and how we switched up our presentation just based off of our audience and our environment and our goal. That's the last thing, goal, right? There's more of a, there's more opportunity for an impact here because mm -hmm. these are actual people who can vote on a bill that will, you know, put, be put into law. So now that we've talked about the age, we move on to the architecture of a presentation. And it's really just the same way as you've been doing you know, since high school with your essays. So you've got your intro, your body, and your conclusion. So let's break those down a little bit. Your intro has to do a few very important things. First of all, you want to grab the attention of your audience. It's not enough just to be in the same room with people. Everyone has, in most situations, people have laptops or smartphones. We're all Stanford students. Everyone's very distracted. If the teacher is really nice, maybe there's snacks being passed around the room. There's so many things that are competing with you for the attention of your audience. So some of the question is, how do you grab the attention of your audience? And the, there are some brothers at the business school, Chip and Dan Heath, who looked into different urban legends, different advertising campaigns, and tried to figure out what makes a message stick. So they came up with some criteria. A message should be simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and it should involve stories. Just think about, you like that, Max? They tried to just uh, kind of compensate at the end there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you got it now. <laughs> so yeah, like like Max noticed, it should your your attention getter should be successful. And just think about how I tried to do that when I was telling the story of the challenger in the beginning. Once you grab the attention of your audience you want to give a preview of where you're going. How many of you in here read chapter books? Okay, basically all of you, right? 
How many of you look at the chapter titles before you start reading? Does anyone want to share why you do that? Do you have an idea about what you read? Sure. How does that help you as a reader? Help me determine if I want to go to bed or if I want to keep reading. Okay. Yeah. Good point. What, what if, if you have to? Whether it's going to be boring or whether it's going to be exciting, possibly. It's hard to get that off from the title, but it's a good indicator. That's a great point. You can use that to assess whether or not you even want to read it. But what if you're reading it for school? What if you have to read it? How can looking at the, the section titles help you? Let's get someone else. Yes. And name again? Patty. Patty. It's like a good outline for you almost, um, especially if it has like section titles within the chapter. It gives you almost the outline that the author was working with, and then obviously the body is going to fill you in on what the exact information is. But if you remember the title, you might be able to even kind of over, like overview what is going on inside the whole chapter. Definitely. And then as as that content's coming in there, you can kind of put it into that mental frame if you already have, because you already know where the author, or in this case, the presenter, is going with it. Very good. So notice how I gave a preview, right? I told you we talked about three main things today, content, visual aids, and delivery. And then finally, you want to show the audience why does your message matter to them. Notice how I talked about how we're all here in different majors, we're going to do different things in life, but no matter what we do, we're all going to have to give presentations and do different types of oral communications. These are very important skills for all of us to build. Once you've got the intro down, you move on to the body. And this should really do one main thing, which is that everything you say should converge on your main take-home message. Notice you have your three, you know, your supporting points, but they're all converging on your bullseye, the main take-home message. And I know, because I was in this class literally just two years ago, I remember we had to write this long paper before, and then we had to condense it all into a presentation that can't be any longer than 10 minutes. So a lot of cool things you'll find that and you're, when you're writing your paper, that you won't be able to fit into your actual presentation. And we call that interesting but irrelevant. So make sure to filter that out so that you get, you, first of all, you want to end on time, but also your argument, arguments can be stronger if you're sticking on your main point. And then finally, the conclusion. If you want to summarize what your main points are, remind the audience why your message matters to them, and finally, you want to end with some kind of clincher, something strong. I can't tell you how many presentations I've seen where somebody is going strong, and then they end with, uh, okay guys, um, I guess that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Has anyone ever seen a presentation like that? I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> so you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to be that person. You've been going strong. You want to, you want to end with something strong. Maybe it may be a, a quote or some final thing that really captures the, your main point, because the last thing you say is going to be what the audience remembers when they leave the room. So the last thing you say should be the most important. We've been talking a lot about the structure. Now let's move on to the attention of the audience. This is a graph of how the attention span of the audience differs throughout the course of a presentation. So you'll notice that in the intro, people are pretty engaged, right? People are fresh, people are ready to go. Then they start zoning out during the body because you know, everyone gets distracted. And then finally, when you say something like in conclusion, when they can tell you're about to wrap it up, people just kind of snap back with it. They're like, okay, I zoned out, but I want to know what this is all about. So I'm just going to stay strong for this last two minutes and pay attention again. So the question is, how do you keep your audience engaged throughout the body of your talk when people have a tendency to naturally be less engaged? And one way to do this is something called signposting. Have you talked at all about signposting in this class? Does anyone want to share what that what that means? Someone else, Rosalind, mm -hmm. would you like to share? Sure. Um, when you do things like firstly, secondly, and conclusion before you like enter a portion of them to speak. Yeah. So you're basically almost like providing a narration to what you're doing as a speaker. So saying that now that I, it could be something basic, like now that I've talked about this section, I'd like to move on and talking about that section. Or I'm going to be talking about three things, A, B, and C. You're showing the audience what you're doing. So if somebody is zoned out, you pull them back in, right? Because now they know where you are. And you can change this graph to this, this turquoise this graph over here, right? People are zoning out, you pull them back. If they're zoning out, you pull them back in with this frequent signposts. 
And to give you an idea of what I mean, let me signpost to what we've just talked about, content organization. We talked about how you want to start out with an intro that grabs the, the attention of your audience and shows them where you're going. Then you want to have a body that has maybe around three points, but that all converge on your main take-home message. And then finally, you want to wrap everything together in your conclusion and summarize what you've said, but not just end with, okay, guys, that's it. End with something strong. End with a clincher. Now that we've talked about the content of a presentation, we'll move on to talking about visual aids. But before doing so, does anyone have any questions about content? All right, visual aids. We'll start out with this visual aid here, which is from a 2010 article called We Have Met the Enemy, and He is PowerPoint. What are, you, what are your reactions to this visual aid? Why is it horrible, Zach? There's too much to look at. There's too much, right? There's clearly a lot of information on here, but it, it just is overwhelming because there's too much of it. This slide was designed to help the US military understand the war in Afghanistan. If the, if the point was to show how complicated and difficult to understand war is, and it's effective, but in order to really understand the situation on the ground, there's just too much information here. And then this gets to a really important idea that we always emphasize in the oral communication program, which is that less is more. Because if you've taken the time to write things on slides, people, your audience is going to think that they put it there for a reason. And then you have some people in the audience who are listening to what you're saying, some people who are reading the slide, and people just aren't sure what to do. So then it's just all confused. I see, Patty, you're raising your hand. Why are you raising your hand? Exactly. So Patty and several other people in the room were, were reading the slide, right? Meanwhile, I was talking. So what happens here is because I had so much on my slide, it turned into a competition between me, the speaker, and my slide. That's exactly that's the opposite of what you want as a speaker. You want your slide to support you. So less is more. And a great thing about PowerPoint is if you have more than one point, you can bring it up one at a time. Or if you have a few points, you can lowlight the others and keep the point you're focused on highlighted. And you don't want to go crazy with this, though. I was actually just back in my high school. And does anyone remember that people would do this kind of thing in high school? Does anyone want to admit to being that person? OK, I guess people who are honest here. So you don't want to do this, because then people will remember your presentation, but not for the reasons you had hoped. So less is more. And now I'd like to take, together we'll look at some slides and talk about how we might improve them. Let's start out here. Blogs are like sharks. Does anyone, just take a moment to read this and then raise your hand and let me know if you have any constructive feedback. Kristen? Mm -hmm. Sure, so there's a lot of information. These are all some really good points, and plus there's this random, this random uh, diagonal line, even in that even more random pink triangle. So there are a lot of Dr. Waters. And you can't see the red back here. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I can't read the red header at all. And it's pink, so that's even worse. Oh, that's even now worse. Now we don't even know what the color no is. <laughs> As Audrey, you probably noticed it was pink, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was very trippy. So, anyways, so there's a lot of ways to improve this. And just to build off of some of your suggestions, why not have a slide like this? Blogs are like sharks. We have a great big picture of a shark. Everyone, most people like that. And then there's little text. So how or from what are you going to find out how blogs are like sharks? 
from the speaker, right? You have to listen to me. So by putting less text on the slide, you redirect the attention of your audience back to the speaker. And that's exactly what you want to be going for. And here's another example of the slide. This is actually from the presentation I was telling you about, the presentation about domestic child sex trafficking. This is an example of a slide we used when we presented it to the public policy department at the end of fall quarter. And what we're trying to do here is we're looking at different bills, which you can see the abbreviations of those here, and looking at different criteria of how effective these bills are in the areas of law enforcement. So for example, training, treating, uh, treating the children as victims, and sharing information across states. We got some feedback that for congressmen who are so busy, they might not be able to really synthesize this at a glance. So we switched up a little bit to do this. Here we have the bills in the columns, the different areas in the rows, and we have a color scheme. So a green circle means it's fully, addre fully addressed, red, uh, yellow means partially addressed, and red means it's not addressed. Now a congressman can quickly look at this and see that, that these, these two bills here, they have all greens. They're most effective. Does that make a little bit, is, can you get that message quicker at a glance? If you saw how, based on our audience, we try to change our visual aid just to make it just more obvious. And a lot of times, too, in presentations, you'll be presenting on data or data. And tables work really well on paper because the audience has time to scour over the table and figure out exactly what's going on. But in a presentation, you're going from slide to slide. There isn't really that luxury. So if you have a table, maybe you want to focus in on a certain part of it or, or a certain row. But quite often, a graph is more effective in a presentation because with a graph, again, the trend is more visually obvious. You want to have a point for each slide. And if you don't, it's OK to go blank. I often actually build in blank slides into my presentations at times when I want the audience to be paying attention solely on me. But another thing you can do is if you go over the keyboard and you press the B key, this is really cool, I learned this recently. You can blank the screen black, press it again and bring it back. And with the W key, you can do the same thing for white. So just think about how you can build blank slides into your own presentations. Colors, you want to use good contrast. And remember that colors evoke emotion. The, the pink was kind of trippy, right? It just wasn't really the right emotion when you think of sharks. And colors also use them sparingly for emphasis. Did anyone's eyes go to this word when I brought it up? Because it's a different color. So this is a good contrast, the black background and the white text. And the other way around works pretty well. But don't do this. Nobody is going to be able to see what's, what you have there. Some other quick things. Red generally does not project well. And if you want to use different, uh, the same color but in different shades, green is a good way to go. Think about how night vision goggles are in green. Size and font. You don't want to go too big or too small. And then one quick tip is that this is this aerial uh, font with the big blocky letters is known as sans serif, as, uh, as opposed to Times New Roman, which is serif font. Serif refers to little, like, feet. And this font works better when you're writing a resume or a paper because it puts like an imaginary line underneath it. But with PowerPoint, when you have fewer words, the big blocky letters are you generally look a little bit better. So I know we've talked about a lot of things in terms of visual aids, but what I really want to hit home is just how important it is to use your visual aids to redirect the attention of the audience to you as a speaker. And the way to do that is less is more. So using less on your slides, people will get their information from you. And now that we've talked about visual aids, we'll move on to talking about delivery. Does anyone have any questions about visual aids? All right, delivery. If you can remember one thing from today, and one thing only, it is the following. You want to practice, and not just practice, practice a lot. Practice is going to help you with so many things. It's going to get rid of those filler words because you actually know what you're going to say next. You're going to know if you're, if you're going to end your presentation on time. This is particularly important with group presentations. I was just back in my high school, so we were talking about how 
we have these presentations, and we just sit down and we'd be like, all right, you do that slide, I'll do this slide, we'll all email it together, and then just show up and go for it the day of. Does anyone used to try this in high school? It doesn't really work so well. So you all know this by now, but just don't do that. If you want to practice a lot, and a great way to do that, it's nice if you have a, a roommate who's willing to help you out with that, but also there are oral communication tutors. Has anyone been there so far for an appointment with an OCT? So we'll be talking more about that at the end, but it's a really great resource for you to practice your presentations. With that in mind, though, I do want to focus on some specific things. So voice. You want to have good projection lists so that your audience can hear you without you shouting. Enunciation, speaking slowly enough so that all the syllables come out clearly. And you want to not be too fast or too slow. And if you're having troubles with speed, enunciation, or projection, what I recommend is you take whatever you have a weakness in and force yourself to practice in the, on the opposite end of the spectrum. So if you're naturally someone who speaks too quickly, force yourself to practice speaking as slowly as you possibly can. Because then when you actually show up and go for it, you're going to come in in that nice middle range. And the same thing works for all these, all these other issues. Your tone. Your tone should uh, be appropriate to your content. So if I'm talking about the Challenger disaster, and I'm just as excited as, that, as if I'm at a little kid's birthday party with balloons, you're just going to think I'm really weird. That doesn't really match because I'm what I'm saying is I'm talking about a natural tragedy. However, you always want to show some level of enthusiasm for what you're saying, because if you don't show that you care about your presentation, why should your audience care? And then finally, it's not just about what you say, it's also about what you don't say. Pausing and breathing. You'll notice that effective speakers will pause after the main points to really let them sink in. In fact, when I'm giving presentations, I often will take like my script and I'll just put little marks where I want the strategic pauses to go. It's something that's planned. It's very deliberate. Take a look at this. It is of the utmost importance to speak in a manner that facilitates understanding and compare it to the following. It's very important to speak in a way that is easy to understand. Which one sounds better to you? Why the second one? Samira, you said the second one, right? Yeah, so it is actually easier, easier to understand. I think sometimes we have this whole uh, thing that we're all Stanford students, we got to use as many SAT words as possible when we speak. But if you try to use big words, people are just going to think you're trying to sound smart. But if, like Samir said, they can actually understand your message, then they're actually going to think you're smart. So I'd say, generally speaking, the second way is the way to go. Nonverbal. This, uh, a lot of questions come up about this. So I just want to touch on a few things. So one, one thing is about how to stand, right, and what to do with your hands. And I first want to show you some things not to do. And in the oral communication program, we have funny names for these. So you want to avoid what we call the fig leaf. Also want to avoid the handcuffs. The handcuffs often involve swaying. And watch out for the dictator. What all these do, and oh, oh of course, hands in the pocket, that's the, old, that's the classic one. What all these do is they close you off to the audience because they take your hands away from where you can gesture naturally. So really the best way to go in terms of what to do with your hands and how to stand is just stand, your neutral position should be like this. Feet shoulder width apart, hands by your sides. From this neutral position, you can gesture naturally. And gesturing is not arbitrary. You can do it to help your presentation, right? For example, let's say you're trying to show contrast. On the one hand, I'd like to talk about this. On the other hand, I'd like to talk about that. Or to show transitions. Now that I've finished talking about section A, I'd like to move on to talking about section B. And those transitions you, you can actually show with your, your whole body. So you can move as you're transitioning from section to section. Now that I've finished talking about section B, I'd like to move on to talking about section C. And then the last thing I want to touch on is eye contact. And this is something I used to be pretty confused about when I was 
just, a, just starting out in power two, and something I learned from Dr. Waters. I used to think eye contact was all just about constantly looking around the room, almost like a bobblehead doll. What I learned is that what eye contact is really about is establishing a personal connection with every single person in the room. And the way to do that is to hold your eye contact for at least two seconds before moving on to the next person. And if you can get effective at this, and it does take practice, you can end your presentation with everyone in the room feeling that you've spoken personally to them. Those are some things I just like to highlight in terms of nonverbal. One other fun thing I like to throw in there, just for anyone who likes TED Talks, I think there's a TED Talk on this, there's some research on this. This is called the power pose. Dr. Wise, do you know anything about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are actually um, hormonal neurotransmitter differences uh, in the body when you actually um, take up space. In other words, if you do what they call power posing, where you do this, or this, or spread out for a few, a certain amount of time, I don't know, a minute or two, before a presentation that actually boosts the confidence hormones um, and neurotransmitters. So if you're particularly, if you're unconfident or concerned or have kind of a lot of anxiety around speaking, in addition to diaphragmatic breathing, which we will practice, you can do some power posing where you're like, again, just take up more space. And again, you're going to boost at a neurochemical level uh, the confidence in your body and your brain. So yeah, it's a great, so listen to the TED Talk. It's a great, uh, great opportunity. Thank you. And if you caught what Dr. Waters was saying, she's not recommending that you go and present like this. No, no, no before. Do before. <laughs> yeah. Something, yeah, it was back and there. Something to do before your presentation. Not around the table either. You know. <laughs> Get each other in the elbow. Speech anxiety, this comes up a lot. So I just want to give you a few things to think about. First of all, what can you what can you list as some as some symptoms of speech anxiety? Mm -hmm. Other symptoms of speech anxiety? Quick speech. Quick speech. Definitely. These are all symptoms of speech anxiety. But remember that these are also all symptoms of excitement. And that's why you want to take that nervous energy and channel it into enthusiasm for your presentation. So take something that you thought was a crutch and use it as a strength. And then also it's very easy that when you're up here to feel that, ev that you're being judged. Everyone's eyes are on you. There's 15 or 20 people in the room and everyone's looking at you. But instead, you want to reverse the psychology. You want to think of your, yourself as a tour guide. You're providing a service to your audience because you are helping them to become more informed about whatever topic you're presenting on. So you're looking at the, instead of focusing how they're looking at you, you're looking at them to see, watch their facial, facial expressions. Do they understand what I'm saying? Do I need to slow down? Do I need to engage the audience more frequently with questions? If you put the spotlight on the audience, you take a lot of pressure off of yourself. So we've talked about a lot of things this afternoon. We started out by talking about content and the importance of knowing your audience goal and environment. Then we talked about visual aids and how to use visual aids that enhance and don't distract from your presentation. And then finally, how to wrap that all together into an effective delivery and the importance of practicing a lot. Let's go back to how we started out, the story of the Challenger disaster. And just imagine for a moment that I told the story instead of the way I did with this slide. How would it have been different? Brittany, how would have, is it Brittany? Yeah. How would it have been different? Um, I think it's most effective to be using one text and not the video itself. Mm -hmm. Any, can anyone elaborate how it would be less effective? Sure. Yes, Amy. You know the point of the story that you're trying to get at, and you back off of that because you've really built the text before you've gotten there, and then look at how it would probably be a fact of your content. Yeah, there's no impact. There's no seeing the pictures of the astronauts beforehand to build that emotional connection. There's no suspense. Maybe some of you who haven't heard about the Challenger disaster didn't know that it, that it led to, that it was a disaster. 
So you lose a lot just by throwing all this information on the slides. But just think about how this is really our typical PowerPoint slide, right? We have our picture, we have our title, we have our points. This is what we've been used to ever since we learned how to use PowerPoint. So just think about how you can be more creative and break out of this typical mold and use PowerPoint with less text and more pictures to tell stories, to create a narrative. And I'm sure that as all of you continue to build these skills, you will blast off in your presentations, not to be too corny. This, by the way, is from a successful space launch in 2006. I would like to give some credit to some people in the oral communication program who have helped me with this presentation, particularly my manager, Lindsay Yeager, and another OTT News a post top, Alia Rachel. And then, of course, you should not be a stranger. This is our new building. Did, have it, did any of you, have any of you ever been to the Hume Writing Center? We were next door to it today. Oh yeah, you just write, you know where it is, right? You know, it's a good, it's Who's been building. in it? You, have anybody been use, making use of it? Okay. So, uh, it's no longer just the Hume Writing Center. It's now the Hume Center for Writing and Speaking. So you can go there to take care of both of those. And there, you can make appointments uh, I think every day of the week except for Saturday, and there are also drop-in sessions. So even if you haven't made an appointment, there you can just show up. So for example, I have drop-in hours which are on Sunday nights, 7 to 9 p.m. So this is a great way to come if, if you're working on your, your research proposal, if you are trying to take something you've written in your paper and put it into your presentation for this class, if you want to actually rehearse your presentation, all great reasons to go in. And I think a lot of people, a lot of sophomores have really positive experiences with OTTs, and then they just totally forget about it until they graduate. And I recommend that you don't do that. I myself am, am an OCT, and I've been through Power 2 and all that, but every time I have to give a presentation, I personally make multiple appointments with OTTs, because I just know how valuable it is. And another thing that might interest you is that OCTs don't just help with presentations, they also do mock interviews. And so it's not just something that you'll see at the CDC. I, there was a kid who was actually in your grade who came in last year. We, we did, I did a mock interview with him for one of these SIG fellowships, and he emailed me afterwards to let me know that he got the he got the fellowship and he'd be in South America for the summer. So there's a lot of success stories from these mock interviews uh, at, with OCT, so I definitely suggest that you check it out. And of course, Ted. Yeah. Uh, just clarify, you said that. Uh, Come in and not only will you help us with um, our presentation, but you also help us with creating the potential PowerPoint. Oh, totally, yeah. Okay, so totally, sure. definitely, really, really anything you can think of. So creating the PowerPoint, taking it written into a presentation, if you got a speech, or making it more concise, uh, any of those things. And everyone is required to have at least one appointment with an OCT, right? Mm -hmm. One 45-minute appointment. Yeah. You'll be, believe me, you'll thank me for it because it's such a great resource. They're so helpful at any stage of the presentation, any stage. I mean, starting now and all the way to, to actually, like, rehearsing before you present. And the good thing, remember state trait learning. I mean, if you are able to ramp up and get uh, rehearse in a, you know, in front of someone you don't know well. I mean, we didn't know each other well in class, but you know, you got an OC too, who's a friendly audience, but still, it's somebody new to present to, and they don't, you, you don't assume that they know all about your talk, right? You have to kind of start fresh. It's a really Definitely. good learning experience uh, to get yourself ready to to give the final presentation. So. Absolutely. And that's a great point that Dr. Waters makes, is that sometimes if you're so invested, you're so entrenched in your topic, mm -hmm. you don't realize how something that makes sense to you might not make sense no. to your audience. So an OCT is a great sounding board for that. Yeah. Very good. So I hope you all won't be strangers and continue to use this not only in this class, but for the next two years. Thank you so much for your attention and your participation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Yeah, Ted. Right in here, right? What's the best way to get in contact uh, with the OCT? Oh, that's a great point. I forgot, forgot to mention that. I probably wrote it there, uh, sututor.stanford.edu. Okay. You just go on there, and that's actually that one uh, one stop shop. Did I use that term? For, yeah. <laughs> one stop shop for you can make an OCT appointment, writing appointment. Just click um, oral communication program once you go on there. Do you specify who you want to work with, or is it just Yeah, totally. Stuff? 
Yeah, you can you can look at there's a whole mm -hmm. schedule of the different OTTs, and you'll see whether OTTs you can make an appointment with or who are drop-ins. Okay. Yeah, you can even read their bios. So Josh and Sushmita and uh, I, I, uh, Alia and uh, Patrick, there, there's a bunch of people who are very familiar with our class, our class team, who, are, yeah. who have, have ours. So anyway, I, did, I just interrupted somebody. Who was speaking? Somebody have a question for Josh? Oh, I think Zach has a question. Oh. Anybody else? Question for, for Josh? Now's our chance. So you can assure them that you survived Power 2? Definitely, and it was such a such a helpful class. I mean, you shared with me, and maybe you already shared with your class, that person who emailed you oh, 18 I, years later. I haven't, I haven't shared. Last quarter, um, yeah, Jeremy Klein, who's, he's got a big job on Wall Street, like a communication-oriented job, but I taught him in 1987, 88, it's like my first year here, and I taught him, a, it was Power 2 then, which wasn't oral comm, it was still writing, and he found me on LinkedIn, and emailed me and he said, this guy's graduate from Stanford and then Wharton School of Business. And he said, the most, the best class I ever had was my writing class. And he's, like I said, this is 25 years later, he's tracking wow. me down. And, so, and, and we're friends on LinkedIn or whatever the <laughs> term is. But anyway, um, and I'll, show, I'll share with you the, the messages he sent me, but it was really, really good. He said it was so important to know how to write well and that he really got it. And when he, once he, at first I didn't recognize the name, but then I remembered him because I really hammered him on his paper and revisions of his paper, and he came in the day the papers were due with the paper hard copy, and he puts it down on the desk like this and says, I did it. <laughs> I was just was so thrilled to be done. But he really was so enthusiastic about how he took the skills he learned in our class to um, his business, and that it really helped him in his, again, Wall Street, not my, my favorite entity, but he's having a great career there, and I'm really happy <laughs> that he's good, a good writer while he's there. So maybe I don't know. Yeah, so that was great, and I think it's really uh, a, a useful class. It's what you make of it, but it can it can be very usable. And you certainly you can run, but you can't hide from speaking, whether it's presenting a case to your attending, or arguing in court, or presenting something to your um, you know funders, or you know, whatever. There's all kinds of ways in which you have to communicate well and succinctly. So good practice for all that. Any 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 other questions for Josh? Yeah, um, theoretically, if we, I'm going to try to go as many times as I can, but if we could only go once to the writing center, mm -hmm. when, like, when in the development process would you recommend is most important? That's a great point. That's a good question. Um, I guess, I guess probably, like, when you're rehearsing for the final, because there are... You, there's just going to be so many things you're doing that you might not realize as you're speaking, and you need someone to really point that out. And plus, when you're rehearsing there, they can also point out other things. You know, as you're, that they can see maybe there's some slides that need to be changed or deleted or something like that. So I'd say that's the most important. If I can pick one, I can pick one other point at which it's helpful, and that is the point where you've got kind of a rough draft of the body draft of your paper and you're trying to figure out what you can use, what you can pull from that, and what's the best thing to pull from that to put into the presentation, right? Because you can't, you can't do it all. You can't read your 10-page paper. You know? <laughs> You've got to be selective. And I think the OCTs have been particularly helpful at helping people be selective about how to translate from the written to the oral. So that's another really good point at which to go. Yeah, another question. So preferably you'd like us to come in with a uh, PowerPoint already somewhat put together. Because I'm assuming it's easier to just try to re rearrange and fix some of that stuff and then try to put it together there in a 45 minute plan. It's whatever you, whatever you know. What it's whatever you go in with. I've done, I've done both as uh, someone who's gone in. I mean, it's like like a lot of things. If you go in prepared, and the more you go in prepared, maybe the more you get out of it. But if you're in a tight situation and you just say, hey, listen, I just want to work with you to put these pictures in and make this PowerPoint, you can totally do that. And when you want the help, come on in. And then sign up early, everybody, because it gets really, really crowded later in the term. I mean, I know they do their best to accommodate everyone, but you want to get in early, so that's my suggestion. Any other? Okay, I think we should wind up. So thank you so much, Josh. We appreciate and we're looking to read that one article and then pull out some core points and a working thesis for Wednesday and we'll workshop it. Okay? Very good. Thanks, everybody. Great job today.
And um, at least one other class has voted um, South Korean gaming as their uh, favorite presentation. So <laughs> I have, we have.